So if we're steel jumps in on the actual substance, we should take two plugs. One for Paula and the work of geopolitics. It is a pretty special place that I think um, for Steel and me both reconnect us with um, our love of teaching and our love of academia and our love of life on campus. And so we teach. And the second is we'd encourage as many of you um, as are interested to participate in one of our two classes. We teach how Congress works in the spring and we teach how campaign works, how campaigns work in the fall. So um, we are proud, proud former alums. We love what geopolitics is doing and we are trying to help amplify it through our work teaching McCourt. So thanks, Paul. I that. Sorry, Steve. I just wanted to put in two quick plugs before we got going. No, it's, it's, it's important. The, um, so the term consultant is almost intolerably broad. It generally describes anyone who does um, professional work, often paid hourly, doesn't have, generally doesn't have a law degree. Um, you know, what I do, and I'll let Scott speak more specifically to what he does, is, is called public affairs consulting. So our job is to help clients um, who are nonprofits, corporations, or associations make complicated public policy arguments in an appealing and relatively easy to understand way to the right audiences. And, you know, we call on experience that that I have come from um, working for 12 or so years on Capitol Hill, as well as three presidential campaigns and a number of statewide campaigns. Um, I was actually a com campaign consultant in 2016 and 2018, working with the National Republican Congressional Committee to try and um, win House races for, uh, for the Republican Party. Um, and in a campaign context, again, the, the description is almost incredibly broad. Um, what people frequently talk about when they're talking about the consultants is a class of general consultants who are people who have such experience on campaigns that campaigns can't afford to hire them full-time as campaign managers, but consult with them regularly offering counsel. Your debate coach is generally a consultant. You have a media consultant. You have a, uh, sometimes your pollster calls his or her, him or herself a consultant. Um, in the world of Washington, downtown, K Street, whatever you want to call it, it is almost equally broad. Um, sometimes it's a euphemism for people who are essentially lobbying, but choose not to go through the registration process. Uh, sometimes it's public affairs folks. Sometimes it's straight up communications. Um, sometimes it's basically anything that professionals do um, that's not the practice of law or accounting or some strictly defined profession. Okay, Scott, clean that up. <laughs> um, well said, my friend, well said. I think there are a couple of ways to bifurcate this. One, um, in DC parlance, um, is sort of you can divide it in a sort of bipartisan, nonpartisan, or partisan way, right? So Steelworks are a firm that has Democrats and Republicans. Um, those started by Republicans this time. No, that's a fair. Sorry, this is Democrats and Republicans. I work at a firm that is um, entirely Democratic. And so as a result, we can do different things, right? And then there are places, pick an Edelman or a, you know, a law firm and others that will sort of, others will not take partisan clients at all, right? You can sort of, some will take causes, some will take uh, campaigns and some won't, right? So for example, we as Democrats are happy to consult for the human rights campaign and and Emily's List and the ACLU and others, and not the ACLU is reflexively partisan, but um, but a host of democratic causes and campaigns that not every consultant will take, right? We were born out of the Obama campaign in 2000, after the first campaign in 2009, and many of us worked in, in um, roles on Capitol Hill and in campaigns for Democrats, and I think feel very strongly about candidates and campaigns. So we represent campaign committees and campaigns who help elect Democrats on top of our corporate and nonprofit work. So I think the way I would think about sort of one way to break it apart is sort of, do you want to be a partisan? Do you want to work with someone that sort of can do corporate and nonprofit work, but also can sort of take on partisan clients? Do you want to do things that are bipartisan and have D's and R's together? Or do you want to think, do things that sort of don't take cause at all, do corporate work or do you know, issue-based work or other things that sort of um, lets you um, sort of step apart from that partisanship entirely. And to that end, I think another way to bifurcate all this stuff or 
trifurcated as I guess I did in the last instance, if that's a word, is, is to think about whether you're lobbying or not. Because sort of at its essence, that is a big divide in Washington. And particularly for Democrats, it's it's got its own sort of, for many to go into them in an administration later, to choose to lobby or not, particularly for Democrats who, starting with um, Barack Obama's campaign in 2008, have sort of, the he said if he won, he would not hire lobbyists. So there are lobbyists for a host of, no matter your persuasion or your partisanship, what did you say, Steve? I said he then hired a lot of lobbyists. He then hired a lot of lobbyists and had to explain it every time he did it, right? But, you know, I think a lot of us think of the lobbyists as um, representing sort of pick your uh, thank you for smoking adage, right, from, from that famed book and movie. But, you know, working either at a firm or for a sort of big, scary industry. But, you know, President Obama has a legislative affairs shop and so does President Trump. Those are lobbyists for the White House. States and cities have lobbyists. Um, causes and, and others have lobbyists on top of companies. So sort of deciding whether or not you want to lobby is a sort of seemingly slightly bigger choice for Democrats than as Republicans, but it is one that sort of defines whether you are working on the Hill and actively engaging with either state legislators or, or members on Capitol Hill or not. But sort of that is another way to kind of bifurcate how you want to consult and what you want to do. But to pull back, I think Steele's right. It is you can represent causes, campaigns, associations, companies, and everything in between. And I think he and I have done a lot of that work. And I think the idea is right, that people want your counsel. And you may not want to work there full time, and they may not want you full time. And um, so that's everything from sort of a weekly call on through essentially being immersed and embedded into their team on through sort of calls when you need us. Um, and that's, it varies based on relationship. I think people come from subject matter expertise. They come from relationship backgrounds where sort of you knew them in past lives and want to bring them back in. They come with sort of built-in political knowledge. And we have friends who worked for senior senators and congressmen and are called because they can influence that member specifically. I mean, you get relied on for your skill set, your previous lives, your relationships, sort of what people think you are good at. And so you have to be able to make the case you're very good at a specific thing and that someone should hire you not only as a full-time, rather than being a full-time employee, that sort of, they should let you join them to opine or do work for them outside of their existing structure, that you're going to provide additional value. You have to just show them what that value is and continue to do so or they're not going to, or they're not going to retain. But I'll pause and I feel like still you probably have more thoughts before you want. No, I think, I think that's exactly right. I think that the, it's an, it's always an interesting relationship uh, with a client. And one of the things that I like about um, the consulting business, at least as is, is I practice it, is that I have meetings on different topics throughout the day with different clients facing different challenges. Um, so we're talking about healthcare from 9 a.m. to 10 a.m. We're talking about uh, you know, a technology company from 10 a.m. to 11 and you know, a transportation issue from 11 to noon. And all of that is really interesting. They have different challenges and different resources. And I just kind of get, my feet fall asleep if I'm in the same place too long. So I kind of like dealing with these different challenges throughout the day. And um, thus far, clients have been willing to pay for it. Yeah. And I think, look, Steele and I both come from communications backgrounds. I think we share that sentiment that sort of, we were never the ag expert in a room or the, um, you know, or the vets expert or the sort of the policy substantive person. So the desire and the ability as a communicator to sort of, hey, someone calls you on a tax issue, a health issue, a trade issue, uh, <clears throat> that is sort of replicated in <clears throat> communications life. Now, there are others we know who specialize on one thing. Like I have someone who's a trade expert. People call him on trade specific things again and again and again. It's either um, one specific moment um, where there's a big trade deal either coming or not coming. He gets to influence it on a couple of different folks' behalf. But Steele and I get to be involved in a healthcare fight and a tax fight and a trade fight and political campaigns, a host of other stuff that we care about. And I think we like that life. And um, it is entities trying to, in our case, influence public policy, whether it's legislation or regulatory action or, or a host of other things, but we're not working members. We're not getting to know the banking legislative assistant for a certain senator. We are sort of doing the rest of it, which is talking to reporters about it, building digital campaigns around it, 
sort of figuring out um, who your allies and advocates should be, building coalitions, all those pieces around it. And it's something that we did while we were on the Hill to make a case. And now we're doing it um, and on campaigns. And now we're doing it um, in our new lives as well, our newish lives as well. Yeah, and one of the nice things about that is you get to be involved in whatever is kind of front of mind in town at any given time. You know, when the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act 2017 was was the biggest story in town, 75% of my time was given to tax projects. At the moment, I'm spending a lot of time with people who either wanted to get things in the coronavirus virus three stimulus response, whatever we're calling the bill, uh, and got them and want to make sure that, that they have a good story to tell about how they helped and how they will help going forward, or people who didn't necessarily get exactly what they wanted and want to prepare for a few months down the line, whenever there's another bite of the apple, to be ready to make the argument that we were left out of the last bill. These are the dire consequences for communities across this country, and this is why you should include us in any future uh, legislative or regulatory response. So it's kind of fun to always be, you know, running to the sounds of the guns in a proverbial sense to to be part of the big fight that's going on. Yeah, and these are people that we've both worked with over a lot of years or um, clients who we work with recommend other clients to us. Right. Um, right. But you sort of have to show them you're doing the job and you have to stay on top of it. I mean, I like Michael, love the sort of call when the moment has arrived. I mean, I think part of the reason we did what we did was we liked reading about the news every day and wanted to be involved and immersed in, in, in being a part of it when we were on the public side. And I think it's more of the same now. I mean, I, I, for me, it started when I was, I feel like sometimes the anecdotal story is a little helpful here. I was actually at Georgetown as a fellow. I'd just come back from um, uh, my last public sector job and was mulling what to do and ended up having three or four different clients. And I was like, all right, wait, I could go to a firm or I could start a little something because I had more than enough to sort of, um, then I, maybe I even would have had I joined a firm. And so it sort of, encouraged me to start a firm, but to show you how non-linear consulting life can be, it's a worth taking a one second snapshot of my current firm, just as an example, right? They started as Obama's digital guys after 2009. And pretty soon they realized that digital folks were helpful, but they were often sort of the second phone call, right? You call the communications firm first and then you get the digital after this. No longer the case now, but um, two former senior White House execs had launched a comms firm. Uh, White House staffers that launched a comms firm. And they decided, okay, let's be involved in the communications side too. And then they they purchased that successful communications firm. And then the communications digital work was thrown together. And pretty soon it was pretty seamless. And then, you know, we had client after client that used us for both. And we built out a research and polling capability after hiring some pollsters um, and have then folded into my public affairs space as well. And now it's sort of a full service firm. We don't lobby. But it's a way to show you that sort of you want to be able to provide your clients a host of different things, particularly if you're in Washington. You want to be able to provide services. And a lot of it relies on sort of what we've done before, right? Our pollster was one of President Obama's pollsters, and he can use that in a lot of different conversations. And it's been helpful. And a lot of the clients were with him in his last firm have folded over and come with us. And he's been able to expand on our existing work to build out more and more of a research practice. So all that is to say, not, not to put in a particular plug for our firm, but to just say that sort of it is a non-linear thing, but you're basically showing companies and entities and causes that you can provide them value. You try to expand that value and the, those services into as many places as you can reasonably do it and hire the talent to let you do so. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we, and my firm has a fairly similar story. The, uh, um, our founding spirit animal is a guy named Tony Fratto, who was the White House press secretary and had spent a number of years at Treasury before that. And so, he was in the middle of the fights over TARP and the, um, the economic crisis of 2008. And because of his background, our initial uh, clients as a firm, this is before I got there, but our initial clients tend to be in the financial services industry, dealing with Dodd-Frank, dealing with the fallout, the regulatory fallout and the political fallout from 2008. And you know, after a couple of years, we realized that almost all of the tactics and strategies and tips and tricks that we were using in our work with financial services clients worked just as well, if not better, for clients in other heavily regulator, uh, regulated spaces. And that's, at this point, practically any big industry. Uh, so you know, what was a very financial services focused firm, that's now about 25 or 30% of our business, and the rest is 
energy, tech companies, a lot of nonprofits in education, early childhood development, um, a variety of areas that, that all have a nexus dealing with the federal government uh, or might. I mean, we also do things that, you know, we've worked with uh, T-Mobile in the Sprint T-Mobile merger um, because while that's essentially a business transaction, there are a lot of legal and regulatory issues that they had to get approval on or can still continuing to get approval on to, to make that deal happen. So I think to that end, one of the questions you probably want to sort of think about as you think about a career consulting is that lobbying, non-lobbying nexus. I mean, a, a lot of people like to sort of, uh, each side will sort of take shots at the other, right? But sort of, we feel like as communicators, right, we have a, communications, public affairs, digital firm, we feel like we are regularly providing our value, right? We can show you the stories we landed, the advice we gave, the strategic messaging things you embraced and sort of seeing the polling get better or the coverage get better and a host of sort of ways in which you can provide value. I think we'd say that a lot of lobbyists claim they're kind of whispering in the committee chairman's ear and then they decided not to do a thing and sort of we feel like our non-lobbying expertise is a little more concrete and a little less ethereal. Um, but in a moment like this, right, where the sort of crisis is real and everyone's trying to get into a bill, being a lobbyist might be more fun, more challenging, but sort of, you know, your, your bottom line is pretty clear. You either got your thing into the bill or you did not, right? And that you either your industry is, help, is being rescued or it is not. And so, you know, it is, it is sometimes perhaps easier to be a lobbyist, but this moment is particularly hard. Yeah, and I think Scott and I have talked about this a lot before, but the the biggest difference in our industry between 20 years ago and today is the ability to measure your impact. Um, you know, you used to hit send on the fax machine, make a follow-up phone call and hope for the best and you'd see tomorrow's paper and know whether you'd succeeded or not. And now every step of the process can be measured uh, and those metrics can be tested and improved. Uh, so everything from did the journalist open the email? How many times did they, you know, how much engagement did you get on that tweet, on that Facebook post, on that um, ad, really any product that we produce at this point, any communications product that we produce at this point uh, can be measured and tested and improved. And what you actually get in the, the publication, the news outlet, is just the beginning of the process. You don't trust that someone read the newspaper this morning. You make sure that you use digital tools and others to get that positive clip, that positive quote, that positive mention far and wide so that you're not relying on everyone reading the media outlet. You're relying on your ability to share that information with the right audiences when you have, when you have something favorable to your cause. And look, we're here to answer your questions. So I think um, I have one more thought before uh, we turn it over to you guys and feel free to either when you have a question, unmute your phone or to submit a question via the, the chat feature on Zoom. Um, you know, one of the questions that we talked to uh, with Paula ahead of the session was sort of how would you get your foot in the door if you did want to be a lobbyist, uh, if you did want to be a consultant or be a lobbyist or anything. I think there are a couple ways to think about that. One, go work at the place, right? Go work for Deloitte and Touche or Ernst & Young or a lobbying firm or a communications firm or a public affairs firm or a cause or a, you know, sort of a, a cause-based entity that specializes in climate or labor or sort of any, any entity you care about, right? The other is do the job internally and then realize you can sort of step out and, and either sort of, if not monetize it, certainly sort of find ways to live a better life while still immersed in the same subject matter, right? So you could be a, um, legislative assistant on Capitol Hill or a communicator on Capitol Hill, do that for a while and then go and realize you know how to work reporters or you know the whole ag community or you know the whole climate space or you know the whole um, labor world or, or veterans issues. So then you can go to a firm and be an expert in that space and take your expertise externally and do that work for clients, either on your own or for a existing firm. So you can, you can start working with the entity, you can become a subject matter expert in the space you can have such good relationships with one particularly powerful individual, a governor or a senator or someone that sort of, you are that valuable in your own right. And that person is chairman of a powerful committee or in congressional leadership or is an important governor or sort of relationships. You can be inherently political and have the ability to fundraise or to 
um, sort of mobilize or you have great relationships with clients already. Um, but for a lot of people, they sort of develop the expertise first and then go um, become a consultant after some will start in young lives as a consultant and go. But it's sort of, you know, people like to rely on you and say, Michael Steele used to speak for Speaker Boehner. And now I feel like he has a sense of what, how to sort of deal with House Republicans, how to manage a crisis, how to sort of, you know, the value in looking at someone's past to help determine the, it sort of becomes a sense of what does their wisdom look like? It's a shorthand proxy for assessing the advice they're going to give you and how much authority you've been sort of given to give it in the past and, and what impact it's had. All right. I, I, Scott has probably covered everything, but if, if anyone has any questions, uh, as he said, either, either, either use the chat or unmute your phone. Yeah, feel free to yeah, unmute your phone. I think I saw one or two unmutes already. Go ahead, Rhonda. Hey, this is Rhonda Craig. Thanks, guys. Um, I apologize. I just got on the call, um, so you may have answered this already. But so I previously worked as a consultant, but more so just in like the media space and with nonprofits. But mm -hmm. after school, I was looking to make a pivot more into the, the pol political policy realm. And I'm just wondering if or what you think the job prospects will look like with the uh, economic downturn that we're, we're looking at right now. And like how, how to kind of make that pivot right now with, with everything that's going on. That's an incredibly difficult question and I don't know the answer. Um, I think that, well, one, the, the number of positions available in the executive branch of the federal government doesn't change, right? If, if um, without presuming your political party, if your presidential candidate wins, then there's still opportunities to get public policy experience in the executive branch. Um, and there are, you know, there are very, there's a seasonality to this in, the, uh, in, this, in a sense that you tend to pick a team when you get to town, either Republican or Democratic, and there are good years for both and bad years for both. And um, I don't, I can't predict what the coronavirus economic impact will be in the next year or, or longer. I can say that, you know, there have been times that like the winter of 2008, 2009, Republicans had lost the House, the Senate, and the presidency basically all at once. And there were 5,000 uh, federal executive branch employees who suddenly had no jobs. And many of those were folks who had spent, you know, 30 year old people who had spent pretty much their whole lives working, their adult lives working for George W. Bush in some form or fashion. They were often married to people who had spent their whole adult lives working for George W. Bush in some form or fashion. Um, and that was a lot of those conversations were, this is not a time to be in Washington for you. You, you kind of go home, go get a law degree, go do something else. It's going to get better, but it's going to be really hard to, uh, to make a living in this town for the next, the next year or two. Um, and yes, it did get better. Uh, but it, there's definitely a, a part of this at picking your time and picking and picking your opportunities. Yeah. Scott, say something more upbeat. No, I was going to say, I have felt the same. Democrats went through this um, after losing the presidential race in 2000 to um, George W. Bush. Then 9-11 sort of meant that um, there was another cycle where Republicans were elected and it was sort of this downtime where it was sort of being a Democrat was hard in this town. And it, that happened again um, during parts of the George W. Bush administration. Look, th the answer is no matter your um, partisanship or the moment, there are certain ways in, right? Like there are certain ways in, if you are from a certain state or district, your member of Congress is gonna be more sympathetic and willing to sort of um, listen to you and potentially hire you. And those jobs, a little like the presidential administration that Steele points out, are finite and they exist and they are, and members of Congress are kind of predisposed to give them to people in their districts and in their states. So that's not a consultant, but that is a roadmap to becoming a consultant. Similarly, I suspect we'll see law school and business school applications spike as steel notes, right? Because people don't quite know what to do and many of them are out of work. I also think, but this is a moment where sort of perseverance and ingenuity and um, sort of all the things that people would want out of their employees 
become particularly resonant in your job search, right? So, you know, if you are willing, if you find someone who's helpful and you are willing to awkwardly reach out to them a third time, you know, a month or two later to just check in with them, you know, that lands right now in a way when the job market is free flowing and easy, you know, that perseverance, while not pushing too far, it's a moment to separate the wheat from the chaff a little bit, right? When sort of the job market is free flowing and there are tons of openings, can you can be as a sort of hiring entity a little less, you, you don't have as many choices. I think right now people do have choices. And so showing your value, I think another thing that we recommend a lot is to touch base with folks when you don't need something so that when you do, it's a little bit of an easier ask, right? If you are, say, graduating in May and it's March, you're not job searching yet, or you're graduating next year, or you you had a great summer internships with somebody last year, or you worked with somebody or there's someone you admire, send you a note saying, I read your piece, or I thought of this discussion we had, or I sort of finding ways to touch base with people when you don't need something makes it so much easier to be in touch with them when you do. And so um, it is a maxim that I think worked for a lot of us, but for those of you who are not natural networkers, this is a moment to lean into those skills, whether they come naturally to you or they don't, but sort of, hey, I saw the funniest thing, or I remember when we were at that Nats game, or you know, anyone who you think might have prospects for you down the road. Um, it's a moment, particularly when you don't need something right now in, in March, but you might in May or in 20, you know, in the fall or in 2021 or 2022, staying on people's radar now shows you're smart, shows you're proactive, shows you're observant, all the skills that people want and tenacious in the people that will ultimately hire. So it's sort of as much consultant wisdom as generally how to get hired in this town wisdom, but it's something that's worked for a lot of us. It worked for me. And, um, and it, it's something that we talk about a lot. Um, and the other is if you have the bandwidth to be able to jump in and volunteer or intern or be a fellow or do something. I mean, it's the people people look to first when they are looking to hire, right? So if you are spending your summers working at a lobbying firm or a communications firm or a accounting firm or a, you name it, um, that's the bevy of folks. That's the, excuse me, that's the, that's the tranche of folks that those entities are going to look for first when they have openings. So it's another way to sort of, and then stay in touch with those folks as you go. But those are sort of general thoughts on getting in, particularly amidst a slowing economy. I think they work um, and it's hard, but it's, those are ways that work for a lot of us. Thanks guys. Of course, thank you. Ron. Other questions on video before we turn to the first chat question. Okay. Checking the second screen of video. I've only got one up right now. I uh, see. Okay. Yeah. If you are unmuted and you have a question, feel free to jump in. Um, if not, we're happy to go to the chat question. I have a question, but I kind of want to hear the answer to the chat question first, uh, and then maybe move into that. Sure. Okay. Yeah, we'll do, why don't we do the chat question, and then Thank we'll you. turn to after that. Uh, so the chat question from Siki, thanks so much for your experience. Wonder normally people start as a consultant or after many years turn to this track and how to say that, how do you say if this person is doing a good job as a consultant? I think as, as Scott outlined, you can do it either way. You can go to a consulting firm right after graduation, rise through the ranks there. Um, the way we probably more recommend because it's the way we did it is to go work in in government in public policy in um in another institution so that you have a um, basis of experience outside of a consulting firm before you go into that as your full-time job but it's it's entirely possible to be very successful doing it either way yeah there, there's something to as we touched on there's something to the breadth of experience of being able to say any of you or any of us have done this on Capitol Hill and on campaigns and for companies. I mean, it, it is, or for causes or for, you know, and it's, it's, it works with clients. I and mean, we just expanded one of our client teams. We brought on two new people 
One of them had worked on Capitol Hill, and one of them had worked at Verb. So we're able to say this one has worked for some of our biggest clients, and this one has done a bunch of our cause work and has also worked on Capitol Hill as a, in both as a communicator for uh, uh, members of Congress and senators. So I think both land, you can do both things. Uh, I think given our backgrounds, we're more reflectively supportive of the, as Theo points out, the sort of public sector route, but we hire both ways. Um, our two newest directors, one came from um, Capitol Hill and, and public sector life, and the other one came from um, a big nonpartisan public relations firm. So you can have both, you should have both. Um, we tend to prefer breadth, I think, speaking for Steele and myself, but it is not the only route, and there are many, many, many successful folks who only worked at law firms or accounting firms or PR firms or lobbying firms or law firms. So, um, hope that answers your question and why don't we go to the follow-up and then we can go to uh, the the second chat question sure so i, I guess as more of the follow-up just getting a little deeper on that i know that some of the bigger firms like deloitte you mentioned kind of focus on process oriented consulting and they have a very particular way that they um, teach their analysts to look at problems and then approach them how do you see that in the public sector and then for us young people that are essentially unemployed as students do you do you think we should focus on learning that process while we learn expertise like what do you think is the balance there i mean i think that there are so my firm trains prefers to hire directly out of college ideally our former interns and we do um we hire people who are either from a quantitative background or uh, a writing background. And then we try and make sure that the quants teach the poets how to do math and the poets teach the quants how to speak English. And there's a set of skills that we want all of those associates to learn and we don't expect them to have coming in the door necessarily um, that we think can be applied across, across clients and across different challenges. If you have the, if you develop the basic skill set, you can apply that skill set to any situation, and that's really, really useful. At the same time, people have different areas of interest and areas of expertise. So if you want to apply that skill set and that toolkit to mostly energy-related projects, for example, you will learn a lot of subject-specific stuff about the energy industry, about the nonprofit sector in that area, about legislation, about the public policy debates, the players. And so there's, it's not an either or. I mean, to be ultimately successful, you probably want some combination of uh, the skill set and the process that I think you're, you're talking about, as well as uh, issue specific knowledge. Yes, I echo that. I think a lot of us who sort of came up through public sector life wish that we had more of kind of is the Mercer McKinsey manual, right? One of those sort of, you know, methodologies that um, teaches you everything from how to leave a voicemail on through sort of, you know, how to six sigma and a bunch of, you know, um, business strategy and, 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 you know, take a bunch of um, management lessons and readings and books when we can and sort of, you know, but it's come ad hoc and organically as opposed to coming in a structured way. So I think there's real value in what some of those firms show and teach. There's also sort of the school of hard knocks, which is you get out there, you go, you do, and you figure it out, right? And I think some blend is probably the best, but you also got to sort of follow your heart and you got to follow where the jobs are. I feel like often in life, we job search in the theoretical when job searching is very um, pragmatic and practical thing. I think a lot of people ruminate and say, I'd like to work in foreign affairs. And they would come to our Capitol Hill office and we'd say, okay, we have a mailroom opening. So you can open foreign affairs mail, but um, fundamentally that's the job we have. You know, you're 21, graduating college. It's a decent paying, fun job in a place that, you know, any recent college graduate would love to jump into. You can probably figure out how to get into the foreign affairs, become a legislative correspondent, and then an LC, and then you could go be a consultant or go work at a think tank or go whatever you want, but sort of, you know, you sort of job searching has to meet the moment. And so you have to decide if you want to go work at one of these firms and learn this stuff that way, or you want to go work on Capitol Hill or on a campaign or at a communications and PR and public affairs firm that does 
some of that training and um, but doesn't sort of immerse you in the structure and, and comfort levels are different, right? I mean, we like steel um, from Bully Pulpit hires first and foremost our batch of fellows and we have a pretty good batch of fellows that we hire and groom and train and then we sort of see how they're doing and we assess it as to, to, to questions. It's hard to assess, but you have direct managers who are sort of seeing how your work is, how your writing is, how your response to clients are, how thoughtful you are, what kind of new ideas you're bringing. And you can sort of assess, you can't fully form somebody, but you can after a six month fellowship get a pretty decent sense about whether this person should be a candidate for an opening you have or not. And it's a nice way to sort of try folks on for size and see if they work and they like it and see if we like the work that they're doing for us. Thank you. Thank you. Um, still, you want to go to the chat question, which I think is directed toward you. Yeah, the first, I guess the first half of it um, uh, asks, could I speak about and name some particular Republican consultant lobbying firms that I'm aware of? Um, so most of the bigger lobbying firms are bipartisan. Um, Navigators and Fierce Government Relations are two. Uh, CCGN is another one that kind of pops into my head that are uh, that are Republican only firms. Um, but because of sort of the secular uh, nature of town that Scott and I were talking about earlier, you're going to have a much more steady business if your firm includes both Republicans and Democrats. And um, so most of the most successful ones are structured that way. Um, on the communication side, uh, the Herald Group is a, is a Republican firm. Um, most of the others are also bipartisan. I'm, I'm struggling to think of, um, I think of Cogent, which is both a lobbying and public affairs firm as Republican. They probably claim they're not, but I think of them that way. Um, yeah. It's, it's kind of two of the things that people frequently think there's a partisan um, agenda for many of these things, and they're frequently not, unless they're doing campaigns like like Scott's firm does. Um, and there's a real, uh, and often many of the consulting firms that you think of as Washington-based consulting firms uh, are actually owned by one of the large multinational uh, corporations like Omnicom or WPP or something like that. Um, so they're, they're Washington, Washington firms, but ultimate decisions are made in London or New York or elsewhere. And then- The second question, so it could be a fun way. I wanna. I'm going to suggest something that I think is a fun way to show uh, the audience sort of two sides of something. If you'd like, I can proffer an example on tax reform that then you would likely have a sort of counter example. That's a fun way to do it. That's entirely sure. Yeah. Um, so gang, um, Michael and I have from days where I was in working with Senate Democrats um, and he was working for House Republicans on through um, some time sparring during presidential campaigns on through downtown have often sort of found ourselves um, on different sides of the same coin. And so the second question from uh, the chat here, the second part of the second question is, um, can you talk about one instance where a client came to you with an issue and what steps you took to solve their problem? I'm interested in learning more about the process. So for us, I think one example, um, we sort of have had countervailing experiences where Dems got healthcare through against fierce Republican opposition and Republicans got the tax reform slash cut, cut, cut package uh, through with, uh, without much Democratic support. Any, any, no. much, any? No, no, no. Um, uh, and and so, that one Republican in committee on health care, so. Right, so, and it was our committee. <laughs> right. um, so with that, I think maybe the latter example when Michael and I were both I mean, consulting lands is a great example. Um, uh, we got approached by some folks during tax reform who did not want to use retirement savings as a way to pay for tax reform. They, one of the proposals during tax reform was to have everyone's 401k plans, everyone's retirement plans, um, changed in a way that it would potentially cost them some money, affect their retirement savings, but earn the federal government back a couple hundred billion dollars and be what they called a pay for tax reform. So basically, from our perspective, it was paying for 
um, a bunch of tax cuts for giant companies and wealthy individuals um, off the backs of the retirement savings of working families. So I messaged well, particularly for groups that I've sort of cared about and worked for. Um, and so we put together alongside lobbyists, I did the communications and public affairs side, um, a coalition of everyone from sympathetic groups like financial education entities and the AARP, um, bigger entities that didn't want these changes to happen from retirement advisors on through um, financial management folks who liked advising people on how to sort of advise them how to spend their retirement dollars well onward. A host of folks were invested in keeping retirement savings um, taxed the way it was, trying to not cost these sort of what we'd say middle class families more and not do so to pay for tax cuts for the wealthy. So we assembled a group of a host of them, made the more sympathetic ones kind of the face of it, named it, built it, lobbied on it, the lobbyists lobbied on it, and then we built everything from a website on through communications, what we call earned efforts, where we talked to reporters about it, on through a digital campaign where we made sure that it sort of, there was not only sort of a website, but there was some social media and social media graphics and other pieces that would show up in um, in important folks' social feeds and in, and 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 on top of you know and, and banner ads on the on the things that they read, and um, and the idea was to influence from the inside with the lobbyists and to influence from the outside of making sure that sort of those who needed to hear and see what a problem this was uh, would hear. It. And so in doing so, members began to resist. And ultimately, the president himself resisted and announced that there would be no changes to anyone's retirement. And there were searches. Ultimately, the bill was not so-called paid for, but um, there were searches for other um, pay-fors, but retirement savings was spared. And I'm not saying that the group gets full credit, but it certainly was a big push in a bipartisan way to ensure that this was not the way to pay for tax. Yeah, and we, we actually avoided almost all of the individual issue fights. There were a lot of individual issue fights uh, in the tax reform debate uh, because we had two big projects. One was working with the American Action Network, uh, a nonprofit affiliated with what we are not supposed to refer to as House Republican Leadership Super PAC, um, to marshal third party groups, conservative activist groups uh, in favor of the overall goal of tax reform. So whatever your parochial issue, whatever you feel about this provision or that provision, we need to, the whole team keeps, needs to keep moving forward. So that was Americans for Tax Reform, National Taxpayers Union, um, Citizens Against Government Waste, just a whole, a big, every big right-leaning um, third-party advocacy group. And then we also worked with the Business Roundtable, which is a association of Fortune 500 company CEOs in order to advocate, again, broadly for tax reform as a concept and to get CEOs with a good job story, people who were, could say credibly, if you lower my uh, corporate tax rate from this to this, I won't outsource jobs. I won't build factories overseas. I will hire more people in the United States. I will give more people raises and benefits. Um, so we spent an awful lot of time and effort working with those guys to find those stories, to share those stories, uh, and to make sure that we were talking about it, not as, you know, CEOs buying a fresh Ferrari, but investments in American manufacturing, American jobs that would result from changing the tax code. All right, we've got another in the chat. Does anyone have any, does anyone want to raise their hand or unmute their phone before we go to the chat? Please feel free. We're just as happy to answer questions in person as on the chat. So feel free to chime in. Uh, hi, uh, thank you for sharing uh, the information. And I'm Jackie. I have a pro I have a question. Uh, I have been an intern before, inter consultant before, and of course not only drawing slides or PowerPoint, but actually I really I did her hear from some senior friends. Uh, they told me that some graduates, they go into the consulting firms and mainly do the work like drawing slides for, for several years, maybe because they lack some certain skill sets. 
uh, I wonder, does this really exist? And if it is, how to get rid of it? And also related to this question, because I'm a first year MPV student right now, could you please uh, tell me more about uh, what skill set or specific experience do you recommend us to have or learn during the next one year here at my court? Thank you. Yeah, I'll take the second part. I mean, the, the two things that we look for are A, um, experience writing, ideally regularly and on a deadline. Um, so that can be anything from a you know, well-maintained blog or uh, our medium uh, page to working for a campus newspaper, working for a, a literary magazine, just anything that shows that you have the ability to write regularly and on a deadline, um, ideally with clarity and precision. Uh, and the other thing is quantitative analysis skills, the ability to work with big numbers and use numbers to tell a story. Uh, those are the two big things we look for. Uh, may I ask, uh, you just mentioned about the big data. What kind of software you used always? Uh, Excel, Python. Um, uh, this kind of thing, or Stata? I mean, Stata, or R, do you use it? Uh, we use Excel. Python, yes. Canva. Um, I'm forgetting the web publishing software we usually use, but um, pretty w pretty wide variety of that. Okay. And obviously PowerPoint. Uh, yeah. Thank you. And to your point about uh, your, to your first item, it, it is true that particularly if you come right to a consulting firm, you are often you were the right out of college, right out of graduate school. You were often sort of relegated a little bit to the bottom of the rung as you show, you know, learn to show value and sort of, you know, it is it is those that have been through the fights a little bit, whether at the consulting locale or elsewhere, that are sort of battle tested um, from a client perspective and from a firm perspective. So it's a little bit of proving your metal and building decks and doing some of the stuff that isn't always the most fun out of the box till you show you can operate under tight deadlines. So you show you can figure out the quant side till you show you can, um, you can write well and all the things that sort of clients and firms value. And at that point you continue to get better and more prominent roles with clients based on your success in that sort of entry level and opening, opening, um, uh, moments of war, opening months, et cetera, if not years of work. So, um, with that, let's go to the chat question. So the, the question is, since consultants aren't usually the experts in a specific field, what kind of insights do consultants bring to the table? I think Steele and I are not experts in a specific topic, but others are, right? You can hire a trade lobbyist or a tax lobbyist or a someone who knows it, environmental policy or gender policy or a host of different things that sort of you know, that are experts in particularly nuanced and tiny things. And so those are experts, they're often lobbyists, um, but those are folks who do get hired for their specific expertise. But if you don't have that, you have to show what else you can do. So for us, it's an ability to communicate and to write and to solve strategic uh, questions and sort of position, particularly under tight time deadlines. It's how to frame defeats in a way that don't necessarily look like they are, how to sort of tout and push your victories and a host of other things. I mean, Michael was talking about how we're all dealing with clients who are assessing wins and losses during what's um, during some of this um, COVID response, uh, the packages now and and the packages that may come. And it's, it's pretty clear that you have to make decisions real time about how to get your Packet your items, your issues, your 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 woes into the relief package, and if not, you have to be able to explain your loss and or sort of get in the fight next time. But it is it is specific expertise, or it is sort of crisis management and strategic counseling that shows value to the client that makes them want to keep paying. Them. All right. We are probably closing in on time. If there's one last one, um, we've got one on chat. So 
Um, we can go to that one. If there is one in person, we can yeah, maybe. <laughs> Sorry, someone, was that you still? Yeah, that was me. I was saying if we had one in person, we could go to that first, but it looks like, let's again, to, with the time let's, issue. Yeah, let's go to the, let's go to this last one and then we can, we can, we can wrap. So the question is, what intrinsic value have you felt come from your work? And could you talk about a time where you felt like your work really impacted lives? Yeah, I mean, my personal favorite in my consulting work right now has probably been our third, I mentioned two big priorities and there are two big projects related to tax reform, but the third that we worked with worked on was um, working with a group called the Economic Innovation Group that advocated for opportun what they called opportunity zones, um, the ability to incentivize investment in specified low-income communities. Um, and that was very quietly and at the end of the tax reform process added to uh, the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act of 2017. And there have been some abuses over the past couple of years, but overall it's a terrific way uh, to bring new investment, new jobs, new opportunities uh, to historically underserved parts of the country. And I think for us, the ability to take we take perhaps more causes, I think, than 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 sales firm might. So for us, it's been fun to be able to um, be partisan in a moment where a lot of things that Democrats about, given all the work that they do on through endless and some some choice issues that a lot of us care about on through the human rights campaign and some of the rights for the LGBTQ, LGBTQ community that were under siege onward to be able to help those folks on through candidates and campaigns. I mean, just this weekend, we saw a bunch of, um, of elected officials bungle a host of moments in Corona response, some with their investments, um, some in choosing to, um, while being tested, um, continue to congregate around other members. And we represent uh, entities that are looking to help ensure a Democratic Senate majority. And so some of them are potentially going to be able to um, better help elect Democratic Senate members are more cause and issue specific, particularly as a lot of causes we care about are, are, are under such scrutiny and, and facing a particularly hostile administration. But I think um, others, you like to think about what you can do electorally and try to change the math a little bit. I think all of those, from the issues themselves on through the politics surrounding it, matter a lot to, to us. And I think it's been, it's been fun to be able to work on some of those. So um, with that, I think we should probably call it a Looks like answering them all. Thanks, y'all. Great. Thanks, everybody, for joining. It was a blast. Thank you, guys. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.